Hello, beautiful people of the Lord. Praise the Lord, right? Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I told you guys that the Lord has had me on this journey of exposing demonic spirits. So the number two episode is today, and it is going to be on the donkey. And what is the donkey, you may ask? It's the Absalom spirit. And why did the Lord show me in a vision the donkey? Well, for one, whenever we start digging in the word, you're going to start understanding why he showed the donkey. But also because a donkey is peaceful. A donkey is adorable, right? It's used for hard work. It's used for um, transporting things. It's used for transporting people, transporting goods, um, all kinds of things. It's strong, right? There's all kinds of good attributes about the donkey. But the thing about the Absalom spirit is that it comes to you like a donkey. It comes to you with that peaceful type spirit. It comes to you with that humble type spirit, but it's false. Okay. So it comes to you like a donkey, but then you start noticing these things about it and you start seeing the truth behind all of that. And we're going to uncover that today. So the Absalom spirit, you guys, is a term that describes a rebellious, manipulative, manipulative, and power hungry attitude. So like I said, people with this type of spirit, they don't come off with that immediately. Okay. They don't automatically portray that type of spirit. It's once you come in agreement with them, it's once you come in relationship with them, then you can start noticing things. And it may take a while. It may not be all of a sudden that you start realizing that, oh my goodness, I'm dealing with an Absalom spirit. But see, that's why it's so important that we have discernment. If you do not have the gift of discernment, every good and perfect gift comes from above, James 1 and 17. So every good and perfect gift comes from Jesus, all right? He is the gift giver. And it's the fact of the matter that if you do not have discernment, you can, Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, and knock. You can literally call out to the Lord and ask him, Lord, please give me discernment because I need to do, be able to distinguish between good and evil. I need to be able to have discernment so then I don't walk into these relationships so I can see these red flags right off the bat so then I don't get attached to, to people that I'm not supposed to be attached to. But sometimes we're called to um, get in relationship with those people and we're called to be in relationship with those people so then we can see. So then the Lord can show us through a situation. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's where we're, we were given discernment to not go into a relationship. And then sometimes we're given to this relationship. So then throughout the relationship, we can discern God works in mysterious ways. Um, you know, we, sometimes we can't fathom what all, um, he's doing in and through each one of us, but we need to always be aware of the enemy and his schemes. And we need the gift of discernment, especially this day and time. You guys, there are so many false people. There are so many false teachers and prophets and there's so many voices, right? So that's why we just need to get back to the word. We need to get back of the word so then we can hear the voice of the Lord and obey it, right? Because so many other voices come in and then that gets us off kilter and we don't need to do that. So Absalom was the third son of David, of King David of Israel, um, with Machai, the daughter of Talmai, king of Jashar. So we are going to start in 2 Samuel. You can read all about Absalom in 2 Samuel 13 all the way to chapter 18. Okay, so we're going to skim over a few of those things. You can read chapter 13 for yourself. Um, there's a lot of details in that that happened in um, Absalom's family, some things that happened to his sister. She was taken advantage of, and it caused Absalom to kill the person that took advantage of him, which was his brother. So a very um, Cain and Abel type atmosphere as far as um, she was taken advantage of by her brother. Absalom sought revenge and killed him and then fled. And left. We're going to pick up in 2 Samuel 14 because David was mourning over Amnon, the one that Absalom 
murdered, okay? He was um, mourning over him and Absalom flees and then it starts to really pick up with distinguishing things that go along with this spirit. First and foremost, I want you guys to understand Ephesians 6 and 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities. We fight against evil forces. We fight against demonic spirits, okay? That is what we fight against. So it's not that this person is the Absalom spirit. It is that this person has the Absalom spirit, okay? So that means that that Absalom spirit is living inside of them because we are spiritual houses, Matthew 12, and demonic spirits come inside. They need a host, okay? They are spirits and they need a host. So they come inside whenever there is an open door for them to come inside. And Christians have demons. Christians can have demons. Christians do have demons. But that is why everything is exposed. Everything is brought to the light through Jesus because Jesus is the light. So everything can be restored, healed, delivered, set free. All right. So like I said, exposing these things is not for condemnation. It is not for judging and saying, oh my goodness, this person has a has a demonic spirit. No, it, it's always for restoration to come. God reveals so things can be healed. God reveals so you can be set free. God reveals anything that's done in the light. If you are praying, Lord, please reveal anything that's done in the dark, bring it to light. And he will do that, you guys. He always does that. He is faithful. He's loving. He's kind. And we want to do what? We want to make the devil homeless. That's what my shirt says today. Make the devil homeless. Luke 10 and 19. You have the power and authority to trample over the snakes and scorpions of this world and not be harmed. So do not fear. Do not fear. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. We don't fear demonic spirits. We don't fear the things of the enemy. Okay? The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Second Timothy one and seven. So you have to understand we don't fear these demonic spirits. Okay. We don't fear them. When we discern them, we do what first? We pray. We pray. That's what we do. We pray. And then we listen to the Holy Spirit about what we need to do next. What the next move is. If you need to go and expose that to that person, if you need to go talk to that person, whatever it may be to confront that person, whatever it may be, so restoration can come, so healing can come, so deliverance can come. It's not like I said to look at them with like self-righteousness and be like, oh my goodness, I discern a, a demonic spirit in you and blah, blah, blah. You don't do that, okay? You don't do that. When you discern something, first of all, you pray about it, always. We always, we always pray. We are always pray without, ce without ceasing. We always pray. That's our communication, right? That's what we're called to do. So, like I said, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's demonic spirits. Walk in wisdom. Ask the Lord for wisdom, for godly wisdom, for his wisdom, for his knowledge, right? Ask him for those things so then you know what the next step is, what what the next step is in, in doing so when you Come in contact with this spirit, especially the Absalom spirit, because of the fact of what it does. So this is what we're going to dig into. Number one, Ephesians 6 and 12. Do not fight against flesh and blood. The next scripture, 1 John 4 and 1. Test the spirits. You guys, always test the spirit. Number three, ask the Lord for discernment. If you do not have discernment, ask him for it. He will give it to you. <clears throat> So, number four, let's dig right in. Second Samuel. Second Samuel. We're going to start in Second Samuel chapter 14, okay? And these are just things that the Lord has shown forth within this scripture. And it's going to be a mirror. I'm going to have other scriptures that it kind of mirrors. So, then you kind of understand what's going on here. All right, chapter 14. Joab, son of Zariah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, pretend you are in mourning, dress in mourning clothes, and don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. 
and Joab put the words in her mouth. So Joab was David's servant. Joab is David's servant. He calls forth this for this woman to come and he wants to her to speak these things to King David. When the woman fell, I'm sorry, when the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor. She said, help me, O king. The king asked her, what is troubling you? She said, I am indeed a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field and no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Does that not sound like Cain and Abel? Absolutely, it does. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant, they say. Hand over the one who struck his brother down, so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put on out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name or, nor descendant on the face of the earth. The king said to the woman, go home, and I will issue an order on your behalf. But the woman from Tekoa said to him, My lord, the king, let the blame rest on me and my father's family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. The king replied, If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he will not bother you again. She said, Then let the king invoke the Lord, his God, to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction, so that my son will, will be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, he said, Not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. Then the woman said, let your servant speak a word to my Lord, the king. She speak, he replied. The woman said, why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself for the king has not brought back his banished son? See what's happening here? Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered. So we must die. But God does not take life away. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him, right? What does Jesus always do? He always wants them that have went away to come back to him, like the prodigal son. He leaves the 99 for the one. We serve a gracious, loving father. We shall know the truth and the truth shall what set us free. What is the truth? Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the father except through him, you guys. No other way. But if you have even went astray, Jesus is calling out your name today to come home, to come home. He has open arms for you. He has a ring and a robe waiting for you to come back. If you have been estranged from the Lord, if you have been running from the Lord, I am telling you today is the day to come home. He has open arms to you. He is forgiving. He is loving. He is kind. And now I have come to say this to my Lord, the King, because of the people have made me afraid. I'm in verse 15. Your servant thought, I will speak to the King. Perhaps he will do what his servant asked. Second Samuel 14 and 16 is where I'm at. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from the inheritance God gave us. Do you hear what's happening here? And now your servant says, may the way, sorry, may the word of my Lord, the king, bring me rest or peace. For my Lord, the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. So what is the Lord saying you need discernment. You need the gift of discernment. And thank him. Thank him because he's going to give it to you. He will do it, you guys. If you ask, seek, and knock. If you truly, with the right motives. Like I said, he knows the heart. He knows the heart. He knows the motives. So what is your motives? Is your motives to restore people, to deliver people through Jesus? He's the deliverer, but you know, you're his hands and feet. Is it for the right motives? Is it to truly see them set free? That's key. Then the king said to the woman, Do not keep me from the answer to what I am going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. The king asked, Isn't the hand of Joab with you in all of this? So see, the king, David, discerned that it was Joab that was behind this, his servant. The woman answered, As surely as you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything, my lord the king says. Yes, it was your servant Joab who instructed me to do this and who put all these words in my mouth of your servant. Your servant Joab did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happened in the land. So see, 
David could discern. He could discern and he was given a word of knowledge. He was given a word of knowledge. He had wisdom from the Lord, which then ended up being a word of knowledge because the Lord told him what was going on behind the scenes. He gave him something that only God would know. Okay. The king said to Joab, very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. Joab fell with his face to the ground to pay him honor and he blessed the king. Joab said, today your servant knows that he has found favor in your eyes, my lord the king, because the king has granted his servant's request. Then Joab went to Jashar and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. In all of Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. All right, so the next scripture that we're going to go to that mirrors this is Isaiah 14 and 12. You guys, your mind is about to be blown. Isaiah 14 and 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. So, what is it talking about in 12? How you have fallen from heaven, devil. It's talking about the devil. What did the devil fall for? Vanity and pride. Because of vanity, because he was vain, because he wanted to be worshipped, because he wanted to be looked at, because he wanted to be sought after, because he wanted to be like over and above the Most High God, he was vain and it caused him to be prideful. And that's why Proverbs 16 says that pride comes before the fall. So vanity set up in his heart, then pride, and that's why the devil fell. So, one of the first signs of the Absalom spirit is it comes like the donkey. It comes like an angel of light. That is 2 Corinthians 11 and 14. Just like the devil comes as an angel of light. It comes as something peaceful. It comes as something beautiful. It comes as something wonderful. And what's supposed to be in your life. But it's actually going to undermine you. It's actually going to betray you. We're going to keep going. All right, guys, this is so good. So just like the devil, it comes humble like an angel of light. It looks peaceful. That is why it's like the donkey. Because in Matthew 21 and Luke 19, what did Jesus do? He rode a lowly donkey. Jesus was showing that he was lowly, that he was humble, that he is peaceful. Okay? So this person comes to you like that. But underlining, when you get close to them, you start discerning these things. They're very vain. They're very prideful. So that's the first two things, pride and vanity. Pride and vanity, just like the enemy, just like the devil. All right, so let's let's keep going. We're going back now to 2 Samuel. So keep a, keep a place in 2 Samuel at all times. 2 Samuel 14, we're going to verse 16. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time when it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it. And its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. So, right there. 200 shekels by the royal standard. So, that is about 5 pounds. 2.3 kilograms is what my Bible says. So, it was about 5 pounds. So, he was vain. He was vain, you guys. You're so vain. You probably think the song is about you, right? He was vain. 
He was vain and prideful. Verse 27. Three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. The daughter's name was Tamar, and she, she became a beautiful woman. Absalom had a sister named Tamar. Remember? Read, read a chapter 13. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, look, Joab's field is next to mine and he is barely there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. So what is the next thing? What's the next thing that this Absalom spirit does? When it doesn't get its way, it destroys. So number three, number one is vanity. Number two is pride. Number three is when it doesn't get its way, it destroys. It destroys your ministry. It destroys your name. It destroys what you have built. Are you hearing me today? This is what the Absalom spirit is sent to do. Destroy. It destroys your church. It destroys your ministry. It destroys your name. It destroys your reputation. It destroys everything about you. Because you did not answer it and give it what it wanted. You didn't feed it. So therefore, it caused destruction. All right. Verse 31. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house and he said to him, why have your servant set my field on fire? So what did he do? He confronted. You're going to have to eventually confront this spirit. You're going to have to eventually confront this spirit. And that is the truth. But you have to have the right motives. Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent word to you and said, Come here so I can send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Jashar? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face, and if I am guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. What did King David do? He kissed him. He kissed him. He showed grace. He showed grace. Grace. Chapter 15. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. So he provided for himself. He made it happen. He made it happen. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him. What town are you from? He would answer. Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or a case could come to me and I would see that he gets justice. So what is the number four? They under, undermine leadership. They want to be leader. They believe they can do it better. That's the number four of the Absalom spirit. They want your position. They want to kick you out. They undermine leadership because they can do it better. And then they have the victim mentality, which makes you feel bad for them. Because this is what he said. He said, oh, if only I were appointed, judge, all of your complaints would be made known and I could take care of them. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I can do it better. I would be there for you. I would listen to you. You know, King David, even though he's my father, he's not doing the right job. He's not doing it right. So if you would just, you know, come on my side, come in here on my team and I can show you how it's to be done. That's what the Absalom spirit does. So that is number four. All right. Verse 5, chapter 15 of 2 Samuel. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. So what is he doing there? That's the false humility. That's the false humility. 
trying to bow down to look to seem like they're a servant, to look like they're there to help you, but actually it's to raise them up. They want to undermine leadership to raise them up. Okay, it's witchcraft, you guys. It's deception. It's lies. It's all witchcraft. It's just like the devil. It is just like the devil. This spirit would take hold of them, would reach out its hand, take hold of them, and kiss them. Right? That's saying, I come in agreement with you. I've got you. I've got your back. They don't have your back. They, they, don't, they don't care about what's happening to you. But me, come to me. Come to me. I've got all the answers. I've got all the wisdom. Sound familiar? All right, verse six, Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king, asking for justice. And he stole the hearts of the men of Israel with false humility. With false humility. Listen, people that have all kinds of huge followings all the time, it's all because they can get people to just attach to them with that false humility. It's false. That's why you need discernment. Or you can be deceived. Chapter, or chapter 15, verse 7. At the end of the four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. So next, what is, it, what is he doing now? He's saying that he's going out to fulfill the vow of the Lord. So he's using the Lord. He's saying the Lord told me. He's saying I'm going to do this for the Lord. Okay? Okay, so that's number five. They will say, I'm going to do this for the Lord. The Lord has called me out to do this. It, this, is, this is all for the Lord. It's all for the Lord. But there's a hidden, hidden agenda. Let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. While your servant was living at Jashar and Aram, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. The king said to him, King David, go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. So what's the next thing that this spirit does? It betrays. It has secret conspiracies, secret messengers. It has secret gossip. It has secrets conspiring to plot against you, to commit something in secret that is unlawful, something that is, is awful to betray. To literally say, it used the Lord. It said, he said, I'm going to make a vow before the Lord. I'm going to worship the Lord. And it was a lie. It was a lie. He wasn't going to do it in the name of the Lord. He was going to do what? To betray David. To be like, uh-uh, Absalom is the one that's to be king in Hebron. You see how this spirit works? This is how this spirit works, you guys. It gets secret agendas with secret people on board with it to overthrow the leader. That's what this spirit does. It goes behind closed doors, having those secret conversations to get people on its, um, on its path and in, in, its, in its good graces. Verse 11, 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quiet, quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Athophel, the, the Jelanite, David's counselor, to come from Jilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. So people that are like this, they can get people on their path just like that. They get people in their good graces just like that because they've got that charming, that snake, that they have that charming voice. They know exactly what to say. They know exactly how to weave their way in. That's exactly what the spirit does. It weaves its way in. Verse 13, a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So someone discerned this, saw it happening, and came and told David. So it's been brought to the light. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. He will murder us. That's what David is saying. 
David is saying, we've got to cut off the, the power right now. We've got to cut this off. So that relationship has got to be cut off. It's got to be cut off until that person repents and that person, you know, realizes what it is that they are doing because it's only to come and destroy. It is only to seek to destroy, to murder in the end. That's, that's what it does. And what is it murder with? I'm not talking about just physical murder. I'm talking about murdering with the mouth. That's what these secret messages were doing. They're murdering with the mouth. They're causing conspiracy with their mouth, with gossip. It says, we must leave immediately. Verse 15. The king's official answered him, your servants are ready to go whatever our Lord the king chooses. The king set out with his entire household following him, but he left 10 concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set to take care of the palace, 10 concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him and they halted at a place some distance away. All his men marched past him along with other Carathites and Pelathites and all the 600 Jittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. Gath is where the Philistines come from. The king said to Itai, the Jittite, why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Axalom. You are a foreigner, an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday. And today shall I make you wonder about with us when I do not know where I am going? Go back and take your countrymen. May kindness and faithfulness be with you. But Itai replied to the king, as surely as the Lord lives, excuse me, I need a drink. And as my Lord, the king lives, wherever my Lord, the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will be your servant. David said to Atai, go ahead, march on. So Atai the Jittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. The whole countryside wept aloud as the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on towards the desert. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites were with him, were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God and Abathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Then the king said to Zadok, take the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But, he's, if, he, but if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, aren't you a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your son, Amaz, and Jonathan, son of Abathar. You and Abathar take your two sons with you. I will wait at the fords in the desert until a word comes from you to, the, to inform me. So Zadok and Abathar took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. But, God, but David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. So this did what? This caused David to grieve. This caused David to grieve. Because the fact of the matter is when you are coming against this Absalom spirit, it causes you to grieve. Because you are grieving what the Holy Spirit grieves. You are grieving because you don't want this person to, to be in this situation. You, don't, you want this person free. You don't want this person to walk by this Absalom spirit. You don't want them to be doing these things that you know is not them. You know it is a spirit that they are dealing with. Now David had been told, Athaphil is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, O oh Lord, turn Athaphil's counsel into foolishness. So right there, David prayed for him. David prayed. That's what he did. He prayed, O oh Lord, turn Athaphil's counsel into foolishness. That means his counsel, the people he's listening to, the spirit he's listening to. That's what he's saying. The spirit he's listening to, turn it to foolishness. So it falls on deaf ears. We can pray that prayer. So right there is a prayer. It's a prayer right there in 2 Samuel 15 and 31. Because God had showed him, God had told him that this was happening. And he was grieving for that person. And then this other person, Anthophil, ends up being a counselor to Absalom and he's hearing from the devil. He's not hearing from, from God and he's leading Absalom in the wrong 
way. So Anthephal is like a Jezebel and Absalom is like an Ahab in this instance. When David arrived at the summit where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him, his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city to say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I'll be your servant. Then you will help me by frustrating Anthal's advice. So what does David do? He sends his friend, Hushai, in as a spy. Won't the priest Zadok and Abathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Amoz, son of Zadok, and Jonathan, son of Abathar, are there with them. Send them to me with anything you hear. So David's friend Ashar arrived in Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. He was sent in as a spy. Chapter 16. When David had gone a short distance beyond the summit, there was Zaba, the steward of Mephoboshith, waiting to meet him. He had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 cakes of raisin, 100 cakes of figs, and a skin of wine. The king asked Ziba, why have you brought these? Zibra answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. What did Jesus ride on? Like I said in Matthew 21 and Luke 19, he rode on a donkey, right? He rode on a donkey. I think that that's just beautiful that it says the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. That's what the king of kings rode in on. Praise the Lord. The bread and fruit are for the men to eat and the wine is to refresh those who have become exhausted in the desert. So, right then and there, the Lord was showing forth that David was going to have peace. He was going to have humility. He was going to have comfort that he was doing the right thing. He prayed, and then he has sent someone out to be a spy. Ziba said to him, He is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the house of Israel will give me back my grandfather's kingdom. Then the king said to Ziba, All that belong to the M is now yours. I humbly bow, Ziba said. May I find favor in your eyes, my lord the king. So, Shema curses David. As King David approached Bahurim, a man from the same clan as Psalms, Saul's family came out from there. Saul's family was from the tribe of Benjamin. And I think it's so amazing how that's the Saul with David. And then there was also the Saul that was turned to Paul. And guess what? He was from the tribe of Benjamin also. How amazing is it that he allowed the Lord, Saul allowed, you know, on the Damascus road for the scales to fall from his eyes to see the truth in what he was doing and to go follow Jesus. Like, how amazing is that? Like, the, the tribe of Benjamin was cleansed through Paul. It's amazing. Verse 6. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, though all the troops in the special guard were on David's right and left. As he cursed Shema, he said, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has handed the king kingdom over to your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a man of blood. So this person was cursing David because they were following Saul. So they were following the Absalom spirit and now got other people on its side to curse David. So that's the same thing that this Absalom spirit does, you guys. It causes other people to curse you. And it says, Then Abishai, son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. But the king said, What do you and I have in common, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, Curse David, who can ask, Why do you do this? David then said to Abshi and all the officials, My son, who is of my own flesh, is trying to take my life. There's that murdering spirit. There is that murdering spirit, you guys. So it gets, it gathers a great multitude of people and followers to conspire against you. It causes others to turn against you. It causes betrayal. And we're going to continue seeing more and more of the betrayal. Um, 2 Samuel 16, 15 through 18 and 2 Samuel 16 and 22. It causes you to want to murder the leader and to murder 
others with word curses. That's what the Absalom spirit does. It causes people to murder with the mouth. Proverbs 18.21, you bless or curse with your mouth. You murder with your mouth. So then, David then said to Abshai and all the officials, My son who is my own flesh is trying to take my life. How much more then, this Benjamite? Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will see my distress, distress and repay with good for the cursing I am receiving today. So David and his men continued along the road while Shammai was going along the hillside opposite of him, cursing as he went and throwing the stones at him and showering him with dirt. The king and all the people with him arrived at the destination exhausted, and there he refreshed himself. So David started to believe that he deserved it. This Absalom spirit will try to make you feel like you deserve it. Au contraire. Au contraire. Oh, but God. Verse 15. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, and Athaphel was with him. Then Hushai and Archite, David's friend, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king, long live the king. So all through this part, Hushai is telling all the things that are going on with David and his men to try to get them, you know, to listen to them because he's being a spy. And that's what ends up happening all the way until um, verse 4. So we'll, we'll start with verse 4. This plan seemed good to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. So Absalom was listening to a shy, had all the plan going with him, okay? Absalom said, summon also Hushai the archite so we can hear what he has to say. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Anthophal has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. So he was listening to Anthophel, like I said, like the Jezebel. He was listening to that. But then Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice Anthophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men. They are fighters and are fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an expert, experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now, he is hidden in a cave or some other place. He should attack your troops first. Whoever hears about it will say, there has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom. Then even the bravest soldier whose heart is like the heart of a lion will melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a fighter and that those with him are brave. So right there, he's showing forth the strength. He's showing forth the strength, but he's trying to get him off kilter. So I advise you, let all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, be gathered to you with yourself leading them into the battle. Then we will attack him wherever he may be found, and we will fall on him as dew settles on the ground. Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. If he withdraws into the city... Then all Israel will bring ropes to the city, and he will bring it down to the valley until not even a piece of it can be found. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than that of Atherphel. For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Atherphel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. So, Hushai straight up went in there and confronted him and ended up telling him, what he needed to hear to get the results that God wanted. It was to frustrate the good advice of Anthophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. That was wisdom. Hishai told Zadok and Abathar the priest, Anthophel has advised Absalom and the elders of Israel to do such and such, but I have advised them to do so and so. Now send a message immediately to tell David, do not spend the night at the fords in the desert. Cross over without fail or the king and all the people with him will be swallowed up. Jonathan and Amaz were standing at En Ragel. A servant girl was to go and inform them and they were to go to tell King David for they could not risk being seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So the two of them left quickly and went to the house of a man in Baram. He had a well in his courtyard, and they climbed down into it. His wife took a covering and spread it out over the opening of the well and scattered grain over it. No one knew anything about it. When Absalom's men came to the, to the woman at the house, they asked, Where are Amaz and Jonathan? 
The woman answered them. They crossed over the brook. The men searched but found no one. So they entered or they returned to Jerusalem. After the men had gone, the two climbed out the well and went to inform King David. They said to him, set out across the river at once. Anthophel had advised such and such against you. So David and all the people with him set out and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, no one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Anthophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hung himself. Because the person that is attached to this Absalom spirit, they want to just give up. It will cause suicidal thoughts. It will cause, it will cause that. You just want to give up because of the fact that your way was not followed. All right? So it's it's a teaming up against. Anthophel was trying to tell Absalom what he needed to do. Absalom didn't listen to him. So guess what? He gave up and he killed himself. David went to May May uh, nah, oh, Mayanam. And Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in place of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Jethar, an Israelite who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, and sister of Zariah, the mother of Joab. The Israelites and Absalom camped in the land of, of Gilead. When David came to Maanam, Shobai, son of Nahash, from Rabbi, of the Ammonites, and Makar, son of Amiel, from Lo-Dabar, and bear Zelai, the Gilodite, from Rolajim. Roa, I'm telling you, these names in the Bible. Don't judge me on that because I'm telling you. Whew, it's hard to say sometimes. Brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and cur curds, sheep and cheese from cow's milk, for David and his men to eat. For they said, the people have become hungry and tired and thirsty in the desert. So this is the last part, you guys. So that next part that ends it up, what does this do? It causes rebellion. You guys, this spirit causes rebellion. It causes rebellion. That's what this spirit does. When you come in contact with it, if you get attached to it and you, you know, become the little besties with it, it causes rebellion. It causes rebelliousness. It causes manipulation. It causes all of these things. It has a rebellious, manipulative, and power-hungry attitude. That's what the Absalom spirit has. But, oh, but God, right? Oh, but God. Chapter 18. We're almost done. David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent the troops out, a third under the command of Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zerai, excuse me, and a third under Itai the Jedite. The king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth 10,000 to us. It would be better now for you to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. So the king stood beside the gate while all the men marched out in the units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Atai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. So see, his he wanted restoration. <clears throat> he wanted to be able to give grace. <clears throat> and all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. The army marched into the field to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, the army of Israel was defeated by David's men, and the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest claimed more lives that day than the sword. Now, Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, or his donkey, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak tree, Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule, the donkey he was riding on, kept going. When one of the men saw this, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. 
Joab said to the man who had told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, Even if a thousand shekels were weighed out on my hands, would not lift a hand against the king's son. Remember what David said. He was following what David said. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Atai, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. It's always for restoration to come. It's always for deliverance to come. Exposing this spirit is always for the person to be set free. And if I had put my life in jeopardy and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. Luke 8 and 17. Whatever is done in the dark, be brought to light. Pray that. Pray that. Pray that. The Lord will shine his light on it. Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, for Joab halted them. They took Absalom and threw, them into, threw him into a big pit in the forest and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all of the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it into the king's valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's Monument to this day. So, what happens then? Now, David mourns. The news had come to David. Now Amos, son of Zadok, said, Let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to, to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Amos, son of Zadok, again said to Joab, Come what may, please let me run behind, behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, My son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. He said, come what it may, I want to run. So Joab said, run. Then Amaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof in the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the man came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another man running and he called down the gatekeeper. Look, another man's running alone. The king said, he must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Amos, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with the good news. Then Amos called out to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up the men who, who lifted their hands against my lord, the king. The king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Amos answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like the young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. 19. Joab was told the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. Because on that day, the troops heard it said, The king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city that day, as men still in who are ashamed when they flee from battle. The king covered his face and cried out, O son, my son, Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab went to the house of the king and said, Today you have humiliated all the men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come 
upon you from the youth till now. So the king got up and took his seat in the gateway. When the men were told the king is sitting in the gateway, they all came before him. You need to continue reading in 2 Samuel to see what happened. But I think that you can tell what spirit even Joab is working in right now. So continue reading 2 Samuel. You guys, that is your homework. Your homework is to continue reading that. This has um, been made a little bit longer, but that's okay because it's about exposing these demonic spirits. We have to understand we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Like I said, test the spirits. We are houses, Matthew 12, and demonic spirits do get in. I'm going to be explaining a little bit more there. I have a video about deliverance. If you would like to um, listen to that part one on deliverance, it talks about the ministry of Jesus is deliverance, which is the truth. Del um, deliverance is the ministry of Jesus. And therefore, demonic spirits do come in. And there's different ways that they come in. It could have been from a long time ago. It could have been from an open door recently. Whatever it may be, it's always revealed so Jesus can heal. It's always revealed so deliverance can come. If you are um, noticing that you are dealing with these type of um, things with the Absalom spirit, I would love nothing more than to pray for you. Or if you need deliverance, kingdomunited023 at gmail.com. Email me. Anytime, night or day, I'm always here. Any questions, I will link all of the scriptures in the description box. But the main scriptures to read right now is 2 Samuel chapter 13, all the way to 20. Have a blessed and wonderful day.